everybody. Welcome back to another video lesson for English for Writing Business Emails. I'm Brian Stewart and in this video lesson we're going over Unit 5. So let's get started. Now Unit 5 actually has four major sections. We're going to be talking about how to eliminate unnecessary words, how to keep related items together, how to use bullet points, and how to use parallel structure. Now the information in this lesson is contained, of course, in the book by the same name, English for Writing Business Emails. If you haven't picked up a copy, please do so. There's order information in the video description down below. Now, the material in Unit 5 actually covers quite a few pages. It's from pages 51 to 60. And looking back, I should have put more QR codes for these different lessons. I should have, bro I should have broken this unit up into different video lessons. I'm sorry about that. So this is going to be a very long video lesson. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll go over each one in turn and at the end of each one I'll suggest I suggest take a break, you know. Uh, go go outside for a walk or you know if you're if you're looking at this on the subway to work, you know, uh, pause it here, come back later. I will put down underneath this video in the comments section, I will break this video down into the four sections that you see here on the screen. And I'll put a little timestamp, blue numbers, that show the time where each section begins. So if you study the first section and then you come back later, you want to start the second section, just go down to the comment section, click on the numbers next to that uh, heading in the, in the comment that I will pin at the top of the comment section, and that will take you right to where we left off, or right to where you left off when you studied, because I'm, I have a feeling this is going to be a very long lesson. So let me quit wasting time. And let's begin with the first one, eliminate unnecessary words. Okay, starting off on page 51, we have four different examples, A, B, C, and D, of uh, sentences that I've received in workshops that were unnecessarily wordy. Too many words. And I would also like to uh, teach you guys another word. You probably already know it. Let's just go over it. But you've probably heard the word redundant. Redundant is not a good thing to have in writing. If you're an engineer, sure, engineers like redundancies, right? Just especially for safety, for example. But in communications, it's not necessary. And in fact, uh, writing teachers will tell you don't be redundant. If you're a speechwriter, that's a different situation completely. Sometimes, yes, you do want to have redundancies. But if you're writing an email, try not to be redundant unless you want to emphasize something, but don't have unnecessary redundancies. And, you know, my background is in journalism. I've taken a lot of writing classes. A lot of writing teachers will tell you avoid redundancies, and that is getting rid of excess words. Now, I can see something here. I can see some people might say, wait a minute. In unit four, we studied how to adjust tone, and when I was telling you how to adjust your tone upwards, we were adding a lot of words. Our sentences, our phrases became longer. That's just a natural part of being more formal or being more polite. So really writing, this is why writing is an art, right? You have to balance uh, considerations for tone with considerations for efficiency. For tone, you might write longer phrases or sentences. You might choose more difficult words, the fancier Latinate words that we talked about last time. But you also, at the same time, you want to make your communication efficient. So you want to cut down on the amount of words that you use. Maybe you think, I should use a simpler word instead of a fancy word. That's true too. This is the art of writing. Trying to balance those two objectives in your writing. And just like learning a language, that is a skill that, sh that needs to be practiced. And the more you do it, the more you become aware of how you can do this, that's great. So keep practicing and keep improving your skill at writing effective, but also finely crafted uh, emails that hopefully will achieve the goal that you want them to achieve. Okay, so let's get back to the examples here. Example A, the original is I was suggested some major media in Hong Kong from PR agency. The PR agency's uh, name or initials are GHK. We'd like to advertise about our company. 
could I know a price of advertisement in top page of newspaper? So I'm sorry, this is kind of a difficult one to start off with. Sorry about that. The next one's much easier. But there's also, it's not just redundant. There's a lot of Conglish in here too as well. There's a lot of, uh, there are many problems here uh, that we could use more efficient phrases to get our message across. Basically, I was suggested, this is incorrect, this sounds Conglish to me. So, for example, the person who wrote this uh, received a suggestion from a PR agency. The PR agency was GHK. They suggested that this person uh, should advertise their company in a certain newspaper. So, this is incorrect. I was suggested, no, that was that's incorrect. Uh, incorrect word order. I'll, I'll correct it in the next slide, but let's just go over the other problems here. The next one is from PR agency. Now, you should start the sentence with them. PR, the PR agency, GHK, suggested that we advertise in your newspaper would be proper English. Not I was suggested uh, by them or from them. That's not correct. Okay. Next, advertise about our company. That is redundant. It, advertise about our company? Get rid of about. Advertise your company. Again, it's very similar to what we saw before in an earlier unit where I talked about there's no need to put discuss about, mention about, or explain about. Other, this is another example, same idea. You don't need to say, I want to advertise about our company. No, just I would like to advertise our company. I would like to advertise our services. And next, could I know, could I know, uh, better, could you let us know? Of course, that's not really cutting down the amount of words, but could I know? Well, sure, you could know, but it's a little bit of a strange expression. Uh, I would say, uh, could you let us know, or could you inform us of? And a price of advertisement, that's a little wordy. It's too many words. And then in top page of newspaper is also strange. How do I change them? On the next slide, I've rewritten this. Let's take a look. So GHK suggested that we contact you. That is much better, right? That is proper uh, sentence construction when you're using suggest or even recommend. Uh, GHK recommended that we contact you about. They suggested that we contact, not I was suggested or I was recommended. That is incorrect. So GHK suggested that we contact you about advertising our company, not advertising about our company, right? Advertising our company in your newspaper, right? Now, could you, uh, could I know a price of advertisement? That's strange, right? Much better. Could you give us a price quote, right? If you want to, if you're contacting a company and you want to know how much their product or their services might cost if you make an order, then you're asking for a price quote. So could you give us a price quote, a price quote, sorry. Could you give us a price quote for a advertisement in top page of newspaper? That sounds very strange. Uh, it's a front page advertisement. Okay, again, journalistic background here. I didn't handle advertising though. Uh, I was uh, more interested in the writing part. Okay, so I hope I can help you with your writing. Okay, so this would be much better. GHK suggested that we contact you about advertising our company in your newspaper. Could you give us a price quote for a front page advertisement? Whew. Okay, sorry, that was a little bit difficult to start off with. The next one's much easier. B. The original is, we recently saw your company's website on the internet. Now here, I highlighted this one. I, I saw this in a, a workshop and I thought, well, that's kind of redundant. Why? Where do you see websites? On the internet. Of course, where else would you see it? I mean, yes, I know it's possible. Maybe you saw a picture of their website in a magazine. Okay. Yeah, but that's very rare. Normally when you see a company's website, obviously it's on the internet. And this is an interesting thing, right? Um, English speakers tend to maybe be a little sarcastic or they may, may, may take things a little literally. Uh, you know, somebody might look at this and say, we recently saw your company's website on the internet. Say, so, well, where else would you see it? Right? So it is a little redundant. It's not necessary to be so obvious. In some cases, yes, it is necessary to be obvious if you want to emphasize a certain detail. But in most cases, you know, we recently saw your company's website is enough. Don't have to say on the internet, that's assumed, right? 99.9% .9 of the cases, it will be on the internet. So it's really not necessary to write that. 
so just write, we recently saw your company's website. Again, look at what you've written, see if you can cut out anything unnecessary, and my recommendation is that you do cut out unnecessary words. Try to keep your messages concise, try to keep them uh, simple, uh, you want to be able to communicate to the other person without a lot of static. Static is like that extra noise in the background, right? Get rid of extra words or extra phrases. That's static, right? They have to wade through that. Make it easy for your reader to get to the point, get to the uh, essence of your communication. Okay, good. That was easy. C. We will discuss about your product internally and make a meeting with you about co-work possibility in a future. Now, if you studied with me previously, I believe is unit uh, three common mistakes, you will see many mistakes in this sentence. Of course, the first one, I hope you caught it, it's discuss about. Again, we don't need to use about after discuss, get rid of it. Next one, uh, discuss your product internally internally means within the company, I guess. Is it really necessary to say that? Let's continue. And make a meeting with you. Make a meeting with you. That sounds very odd and it's, it is uh, too wordy, right? We can uh, condense that. And then co-work, as I explained before, that sounds weird. That sounds Conglish. We don't co-work a co-work possibility in a, fu in a future. That's also strange there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So these are the things that I have issues with. How do we change them? We can rewrite after an internal review. That's much better. Let me go back to the previous slide. We discuss about your product internally. How about just change that to after an internal review? We're going to review the issue inside our company. You know, you, I'm, you know, it's kind of a polite way of saying you're not involved, right? We need to discuss it amongst ourselves, right? So after an, an internal review, we need to talk about the proposal with our, perhaps maybe our management or with our team. So we need to have an internal review. So after an internal review, much better, we may arrange a meeting, may arrange a meeting, make a meeting with you. We don't have to say it. We don't have to say with you either. Just we might arrange a meeting, obviously, because uh, I'm writing to you, to discuss possible future collaborations, not co-work, collaborations. So to discuss and not discuss about, to this, uh, we may arrange a meeting to discuss possible future collaborations. So this is also shorter. I'll just flip back to the orig uh, original one real, real quick. Yep, it's also a little bit shorter and it's more concise. So. I would recommend to do this way. Now, um, it's interesting. I, I mentioned something about future. I just wanted to point that out. In a future, uh, we don't use a an indefinite article in front of future. And in fact, Americans will use a definite article, the, in the future. I've noticed that British uh, speakers, British English speakers, English English speakers, really, the, the original English speakers, will not use a definite article in front of future. They will just say, in future, right? So that's an interesting note I just wanted to point out between British English and American English. Anyway, those are the changes that I would make to C. Okay, let's move on to D. D, the original is, if you want a catalog for further detail or have questions you may have, please contact me. Now, this is very obviously redundant. If you have questions you may have, that's way too wordy. Also, if you want a catalog for further detail, and it should be details, not detail, or have questions you may have, what is this? Uh, there's a problem here. A catalog for further detail, have questions you may have, those two things, that's information, right? We can condense this a lot. Uh, and we can just say, if you would like further information, whether it's a catalog, whether it's questions, whatever, it's just information. If you would like further information, please contact me. Much easier. It's not necessary really to, to detail the different pieces of information, unless you want to emphasize you know, that you have a catalog, You're, you wanna push the catalog on the customer, then just say, if you'd like a catalog, uh, please contact me. And of course they know if they have questions, they'll contact you anyway. Uh, okay, so. Those examples show how you can look back at what you've written, see if, well, of course, eliminate Conglish, try to eliminate um, 
nonsensical expressions or, or strange expressions. But also take a look and see if you can cut any extra words out. If you can, my suggestion is do it because you again, you want to make your writing as efficient as possible. Now, let's take a look. I believe these are on page 53. There are many exercises. Let me just check that to make sure. Yes, on page 53, we have six different exercises. We have the sentences, and then we have space for you to write, uh, rewrite it so it's more efficient. And the, the instructions are rewrite the sentences in a more efficient way. So let's take a look at each one in turn. The first one is pretty simple, pretty basic. Please reply back to me by Friday. Well, you may see right away uh, something that could be uh, eliminated from the sentence very easily. When people reply, who do they reply to? Well, of course they'll reply back to you. There's no need to say that, right? And there's really no need to say back, right? Just please reply by Friday. And that's what I've got here. Yeah, I underlined that as well. Please reply by Friday. That's all you need. You don't need to say, it's too wordy. Please reply back to me, of course, by Friday, right? If if you're out of the office, right, and you want to inform somebody that, you know, I won't be here, so please reply to Mr. Jones by Friday, that's fine. But most cases, you know, you want the reply personally. So there's no reason to write, please reply back to me by Friday. Get rid of it. Okay, number two. This is kind of common. I see this many times when people are writing emails to uh, clients or people that they don't know, and they want to give little uh, background information about their company. Uh, it's very common to say, you know, when your company was founded or give a little historical information. So here we have, since we founded our company in 1971. It's a little long. We're going to take a look at how to condense that. We have always considered quality our top priority. How can we condense that? We can rewrite this since our foundation in 1971, right? We have always considered quality our top priority. Second part of the sentence, no problem, that's good, but you can shorten that. Since we founded our company, it also sounds a little bit odd, we founded our company in 1971, just since our foundation in 1971. It's much better. Okay, number three. Now this is very interesting actually, and this is an issue I think that occurs uh, because people are, thinking in their native language and they're translating directly to a second language. Now, most of my students are Korean and in Korean, uh, you use, use the word chal, right? Hanguko chal heo, right? Uh, chal mal heo. So you speak Korean very well. Obviously I don't. <laughs> okay. So, but the chal is very common, right? Chal barasayo. I received your, I received whatever it was and chal means well. And that's what we have here. So when you translate that, you translate that to English, we received your email well. But if, as an English speaker, I look at that and say, you received my email well, that's a little strange because how can you receive something poorly? You either receive it or you don't receive it. So it sounds strange to put a modifier on the verb receive because it's in some verbs. Now in some verbs, of course, you speak English very well, no problem, because you can modify how well does somebody speak. But if you received it, how do you receive it well as opposed to receiving it poorly? You just received it, yeah, yes or no. You either received it or you didn't receive it. There's no degree of quality receiving, right? So it's not necessary to write that. That's just a uh, translation uh, problem, I think. So just write, we received your email. That's fine. So I know English can be frustrating. You know, which verbs do I use it with? Which verbs do I not use it with? Well, think about as like an ability. Does somebody need an ability to receive something? No, they're just, they're just there. They just have to show up. But does somebody need an ability to speak a language? Well, absolutely, as we all know. So, you know, be careful about, you know, saying something, somebody did something, chal haseo, or, or leaving it out, right? Uh, and yeah, so be careful with that. That's interesting. Yeah, so I see this often. We received your email well, or I received your email well. I said, well, okay, good, but, you know, you just received it. <laughs> There's no degree of quality to that. Okay, let's continue. Number four. I would be grateful for the opportunity to meet you during your visit to Seoul to discuss how we could support you. Now, there's no problem with the grammar or vocabulary, but it is a little bit long. We could condense this sentence uh, a little bit, make it more efficient. 
uh, first of all, we could um, maybe delete to meet you. I'd be grateful for the opportunity to meet you during your visit to Seoul to discuss. Because meet you and discuss are basically the same thing. Can't we combine them? Why, why do we need to say to meet you and then also to say to discuss? They're the same thing. So what can we do? We could write it this way. During your visit to Seoul, we would be grateful for the opportunity to discuss how we could support you. Even though it's in bold type, it's still shorter than the original. Also, and that's another thing that you should be striving for, is to make longer sentences shorter. And again, it, uh, that's another point we'll get to is, you know, uh, make things simple, cut down, you know, uh, complex sentences into shorter sentences. But this is much more efficient. During your visit to Seoul, we'd be grateful for the opportunity to discuss. Obviously, you're going to have a meeting. There's no reason to write, uh, to include words about a meeting, to discuss how we could support you. Obviously, that involves a meeting. No need to say that. So we could rewrite it that way. Okay, good. Number five, your hospitality, which was shown to us, was greatly appreciated by us. Now, you probably can see, yes, this is obviously uh, redundant. It's obviously too wordy. But see, this is the issue that I think that sometimes students, you know, they, they listen to what I said in unit four and they think, oh, I need to have longer expressions or I need to uh, express myself more politely. But unfortunately, again, you have to be careful that you don't uh, overblow the amount of words that you are using in your sentence, right? Don't exaggerate or don't, don't use too many words, okay? So be careful here. How, what can we get rid of? Well, obviously us, us, you know, we don't need to repeat that. We can get rid of that. Your hospitality, which was shown to us, is kind of a redundant expression. Obviously, hospitality is shown to somebody. You don't need to say that. And it was greatly appreciated by us. Again, you don't have to repeat by us. You could just rewrite this this way. We greatly appreciated your hospitality. No problem with that. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but if for any of these, for number one through six, if you have a different idea than the green examples that I'm showing here, please feel free to comment down below and I'd be happy to help you out with your uh, contributions or your attempts uh, to rewrite these. Because, of course, there's more than one way to do this. The way that I'm writing this here is not the only way to do it. So if you have a question, can I write this way? Please feel free to comment down below. And I hope that I can get to them. Okay, I'm sure that I can. Okay, so we greatly appreciated your hospitality would be one way to really reduce the, the wordiness of this example. Next one, number six, the last one. I am contacting you to respond to your email that you sent me yesterday. Hmm, it is wordy. Because we have too much, too much information or uh, it's a little redundant, right? For example, I'm contacting to respond to your email, you know, and I'm contacting you. I'm responding. Okay, well, they're both kind of the same thing. We don't need both, right? We could just say, I am responding to your email. We don't need to say, I'm contacting you. That you sent me yesterday. Now, that's a little wordy. We can uh, reduce that. We can cut that down. We can condense it. How? Regarding the email you sent yesterday. That's one way to do it. <laughs> okay. Or you could write in response to your email dated, you know, January 2nd. Right. So these are two very common ways to begin an email. You could also just write, I am responding to your email that you sent yesterday. Right. That you sent me yesterday. Obviously it's sent to you because I'm responding to it. Right. So again, look at your sentences. See what looks redundant or which is obvious? What's obvious that the reader already knows that you don't have to state? Cut that information out. And this is, this is interesting. I think George Orwell, uh, in his uh, essay, Politics in the English Language, he made a good point. He said, you know, this is a good skill, even in your own language, to do. Because the way that you write reflects the way that you think. And if you practice and make your writing more efficient... What you're really doing also is making your thinking more efficient too. You're taking a look at the words that you're putting on the paper. You have more time. You can review them. You can go back and cut certain words out, substitute words, or adjust it. But as you're doing that, you're also reinforcing that idea in your brain so that when you speak, 
hopefully though that practice will carry over into your speech and also into the way that you think in your thinking so that you know hopefully the goal is that we think more efficiently and we think more clearly okay well that brings this section to a close in the next section we'll talk about keeping related items together but as i suggested before now would be a good time to take a break right go get a drink of water go outside for a little for a breath of fresh air, have a sandwich, have lunch, whatever. Uh, when you you know when you come back, just hit the uh, timestamp for keeping related items together, and you will start right away with that. So good. See you soon. Okay, welcome back. I hope you had a good break, or if you're continuing straight away from the previous section, hymne. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so the next point, the next, the second tip that I had in this unit, Unit 5, is to keep related items together. What does that mean? In many sentences, you might have certain bits of information. Now, be careful that you don't, for example, separate a noun from an adjective clause or, an, or a verb from an adverb. I mean, it's possible you can do that, and sometimes people do do that. They might, have, they might start off the sentence with this thought, interject or interrupt with another thought and then continue uh, with something that is closely related uh, to the idea that they began the sentence with. My suggestion is don't do that because that is a recipe for confusion. Okay, so be careful. Let's take a look at some examples. Please let us know if you can finish the project by Friday. Now this is a good example because it can be a little uh, confusing. For example, by Friday uh, is the deadline, but what are the actions? There's actually two actions, not just one. You might think, well, finish the project by Friday, but they're also asking you to let them know. So there's two actions. Please let us know and finish the project. Which one do they want to know about by Friday? For example, do you want me to let you know by Friday? Or do you want me to finish the project by Friday? There is that possible confusion. And this is a good one. This sometimes comes up, uh, you know, in a workshop, you know, because people, you know, and when you're giving emails or you're writing emails, it's very common to give a deadline. So you don't want to confuse the other person, you know, uh, you know, what, what should I do by Friday? Let you know or finish the project? I'm not sure. So to rewrite it, to be clear, you could write, please let us know today if you could finish the project by Friday, okay? Let us know today, that's related items together. The deadline and the action are together. Finish the project by Friday, those are together. Or, please let us know if the project will be completed by Friday. Please let us know if the project will be completed on Friday. That's a little bit more uh, direct. You know, will the project, please let us know if the project will be completed on Friday. Okay, that is direct. There, there's less chance of confusion for that sentence. Okay, so good. Moving on. Okay, next one. B. Original. Mr. Lee would like to give a presentation to the client using conference room B. Now, this is a fairly common issue uh, with even native speakers, right? Because we want to see, you know, what, uh, you know, when we have a noun and then we have a modifying clause after that noun, it's usually this clause modifies that noun. So, the confusion here would be, um, what's going on? Does Mr. Lee want to use conference room B to give a presentation to the client? Or is Mr. Lee talking about the client who is using conference room B? Is the client using conference room B? It's a little unclear. So how do we make it more clear or clearer? We have Mr. Lee would like to reserve conference room B to give a presentation to the client. Okay, that's obvious. Mr. Lee wants to give a presentation to the client in conference room B, right? The original here, right? Mr. Lee would like to give a presentation to the client using conference room B. Probably the email is, a, is about, uh, you know, reserving the room. So it could be an email sent to the uh, office administrator or the secretary who is in charge of reserving the conference rooms. So, um, you know, it, it's a little bit odd you know, is a client using conference room B? What's going on, right? So this is much clearer this way. Mr. Lee would like to reserve conference room B to give a presentation to the client. Okay, good. Or Mr. Lee would like to give a presentation to the client who is in conference room B. That's in the other situation, right? It could be either situation. 
we don't know. But to make it clear, right, let's very correctly or very concisely use the language that eliminates any possible confusion. Now, again, this is a skill to develop. Uh, again, look at your writing, see if there might be some question, if the other person might look at that and say, do, do they mean A or do they mean B? And then maybe you want to rewrite it so it's very clear that you mean A or you mean B. Okay, good. C, using only. Be careful using the word only. Uh, I have an example here. We have two examples. Only essential employees are allowed on the factory floor. Or B, essential employees are only allowed on the factory floor. Now, usually I would choose A as probably the most logical <laughs> choice here because what you're saying here, the A sounds like it's a safety feature. Only essential employees are allowed on the factory floor. That means that the factory floor might be a dangerous place. And people who are not trained in the dangers on the factory floor should not be allowed on the factory floor for their safety, right? Because essential employees are probably the only ones who have the training, the safety training to be on the floor. So only they are allowed on the factory floor. In B, it's a little strange because what it says is essential employees are only allowed on the factory floor. They cannot go to the cafeteria. They're not allowed in the offices uh, on the second floor. They're not allowed anywhere else on the company. They are only allowed on the factory floor. That is very odd. I'm sure you would agree. So, so that's a little bit strange. Obviously, it's not B. Okay, it should be A. So be careful using only. Okay, the next one, D, the last one, D. We have helped hundreds of companies find their products for the best overseas manufacturers. This is a little confusing. When I first saw this, I'm like, what does this mean? We have helped hundreds of companies find their products. Were their products lost? Right? And for the best overseas manufacturer, are they giving those products? You know, were the products lost? Are you giving those products to the manufacturers? What's going on here? It sounds a little bit strange. How do we rewrite it? Well, we could write it this way. We have helped hundreds of companies find the best overseas manufacturers for their products, right? So basically the intention of this sentence, the original, is that you are representing a company. It's kind of like a headhunter, right? Instead of flying, finding employees to work at a company, you're finding companies that can give services to other companies, right? Kind of like a middleman. And so, you know, there's a company in America that wants to produce a certain line of clothing and you have contacts in another country, in Thailand, in Vietnam, somewhere like that. And you can help the American company uh, find a company in Thailand or Vietnam to manufacture the products for the American company. That's just an example. So that's the intention. And this expresses that intention a lot more clearly than the original. We have helped hundreds of companies find the best overseas manufacturers for their products. Okay, so again, keep related items together. Hundreds of companies find manufacturers for products. Okay, don't split those things up. Okay, let's take a look at uh, the exercises. The exercises will be on pages 55 to 56. So it's two pages, quite a lot. There's seven exercises. Oh, and as you do these exercises, uh, remember to follow these tips on the top of page 55. So don't separate the subject and verb with another thought. Try to keep the subject and the verb together. Also, try to place modifiers directly before or after the words they modify. We saw that in the one example, right? Split complex sentences into two or more sentences. Very good advice, right? If you if you write a sentence you're in, in your email and you notice, wow, this sentence is pretty long, maybe two or three lines, look to see where you can break it, right? And try not to use too many conjunctions, like right? too many examples of ands, buts, or ors, or even however, right? This is These are good places to break the sentence. Put a period and start the next sentence with a capital letter. And finally, use compound adjectives before nouns to eliminate long phrases. In the two examples following this, we'll see an example of that. The first example is A. AI software, if installed properly, could save our company millions of dollars. How can we use a compound adjective to make that more efficient? Well, we could take installed properly and make a compound adjective out of that. How do we do it? Properly installed AI software. Properly installed is a compound adjective. Properly installed AI software could save our company millions of dollars. 
Okay, so use a compound adjective to eliminate uh, these rather longer phrases. Okay, let's move on. Okay, B. Installation of wheel coverings must be performed with special equipment overseen by representatives from Zio Corp. That's pretty confusing, right? Installation of wheel coverings must be performed with special equipment overseen. How do we rewrite this? We could write this it this way, and this is the intention. Representatives from Zio Corp Corporation must oversee all installations of wheel coverings. Sentence break. In addition, special equipment must be used. So in the original, right, we have too many things going on, right? We have must be performed, uh, overseen by representatives. Let's break that down into easier chunks of information by just making new sentences, right? Representatives from Zeocorp must oversee all installations of wheel coverings. That's one thought. The second idea is in addition. Special equipment must be used. Okay, so we express both of our thoughts, and it's much easier. It's much easier to digest this information than the original. Okay, are you ready? Let's do some exercises, okay? Okay, so our first sentence here, and the instructions are rewrite the sentences in a less confusing way. Number one, as an expert in global terrorism, we would like to invite you to be the keynote speaker at the fifth symposium on counterterrorism. Did you see it? It's, it's actually kind of obvious what the problem is here, right? Who is an expert on global terrorism? Well, the person who receives the email, not the person who's, not the people or the person who sent the email. We are not the expert on counterterrorism. You, the reader, are the expert. So this doesn't make sense, right? So be careful here. We should rewrite it. As an expert in global terrorism, you are cordially invited, I just added that to be more polite, uh, to be the keynote speaker at the fifth symposium on counterterrorism. So be careful. Okay, good. Number two, our system, which experienced several electrical failures last quarter, was recently connected to backup generators to avoid such blackouts. This is an example of what I was talking about earlier, right? You start with an idea, you inject or interrupt it with maybe a long phrase and then continue. I would say avoid this. How could you do that? You could write, you know, that's the interruption. You could write, our system was recently connected to backup generators to avoid blackouts such as those experienced last year. That's more efficient and you're not separating uh, the subject and the rest of the sentence by interrupting it with a big long thought in between. That could be confusing. This isn't really an egregious, uh, this isn't really a, a really bad example. Uh, but it is, um, you know, it is a, a habit maybe to get into and to, to look at, to re-examine. Okay, good. Number three, work at home programs. By the way, that's already using a good compound adjective right there, right? Instead of saying programs that are conducted, uh, programs for employees where they can work at home, too long. Just work at home programs. So it's already condensed right there. Whew. But let's take a look at the rest of the sentence. Work at home programs if they are managed well, can save both employees and the company money. Now, there's something more we can do. See, notice that if they are managed well, we can also make a compound adjective out of that. How can we do it? Well-managed work at home. Just stack them up, right? Well-managed work at home programs can save both employees and the company money. And that way, you can eliminate these longer expressions that might interrupt the flow of your sentence and separate, you know, uh, related items. Again, keep related items together. Good, number four. We would be grateful if you could inform us, if you could send us the report by today. If you could, if you could, if you could, if you could. Okay, so obviously we have too many if you coulds, right? We would be grateful if you could send us the report today, right? Uh, much better. Of course, this is more uh, example of what we learned in the last lesson, you know, cut out excess words. It's a little redundant, right? Another way you could do that would be, we would appreciate it if you could inform us when we could receive the report. Again, like I said, there are many different ways to do these. Okay, number five. We noticed a large crack in the machine that was in the lower part. Okay, this is a little too wordy, and it's also, uh, you know, separating, you know, where was a large crack? Where was it? It was in the lower part of the machine. Can't we put those things, ideas together? We could. We could do this. 
we noticed a large crack in the lower part of the machine. That's much more efficient, right? We're putting, you know, instead of saying a large crack and then at the end of the sentence at the lower part of, or in the lower part, put those together. Keep related items together. We noticed a large crack in the lower part of the machine. Much more efficient, much clearer. Okay, good. Okay, number six. After a thorough search of our warehouse, we found several lost parts. They're not really lost, they were just misplaced. Several lost parts on some back shelves that were worth thousands of dollars. Well, wait a minute here. What was worth thousands of dollars? Lost parts or back shelves? Which one? If we're going to keep related items together, right, then we're saying that the shelves are worth thousands of dollars, which is a little strange. Why would you, why would you have shelves? Shelves are thousands of dollars. They're just a few dollars to erect, you know? Uh, they must, are they made out of gold? I mean, what's going on here? That's kind of strange. So we need to rewrite that. After a thorough search of our warehouse, we found several lost parts worth thousands of dollars on some back shelves. Ah, okay. Keep related items together. The parts are worth thousands of dollars. So again, keep related items together to avoid confusion. And it's not just to avoid confusion, it's also to avoid amusement as well, okay? Because people will be might have a little chuckle at, wow, the shelves are very expensive at their company. You know, they, so eliminate confusion, eliminate amusement. Although, yeah, it's, it's great to, to have some amusement. It's great to love what you do, that's true. But again, we want to, you know, keep it efficient, keep related items together, okay? Okay, number seven. Now, this is a little bit uh, different from in the book because they didn't have enough space. So it might be a little confusing. It says, as a result, only our department can hire two employees. That's what's in the book, but you missed the previous sentence that I did not have space to write. The previous sentence to this is, we have a very tight budget this year. As a result, only our department can hire two employees to replace the five employees who left last quarter. And the background information is a little important here. So, only our department can hire two employees to replace the five employees. That's not what the original intention is. It mean, the, the background information is your department has a tight budget. Your department has a tight budget. So your department can only hire, uh, you know, you lost five employees last quarter, but you can only hire two employees to replace them. But that's not what this says. It says in the company, only our department, now of all the different departments of the company, only our department can hire two employees. That's a different meaning. So again, be careful where you place only, those words like that. So uh, we should write, as a result, our department can hire only two, keep related items together. We can only hire two employees, not only our department, right? That, that's not what the intent of the sentence is, and the background information gives you that idea, right? Because of our tight budget, our department's tight budget, we can only hire two employees, not only our department. I'm not talking about the other departments of the company, right? I'm talking about our department, we can only hire two employees to replace the five employees who left last quarter. Okay, so very good. That's a, a good practice there. Keep related items together. I hope you have a better idea about that. You know, when I just said that at the beginning, you may, be, you may have been unsure about what I meant by, what do you mean keep related items together? Keep the thoughts that are related to each other in your sentences as close together as possible. Don't interrupt them. Don't put a lot of unnecessary information in between them to separate them. Try to keep them together as much as possible. And that way, the reader can more easily understand the intent of your written communication. Okay, Whew. that was a, kind of a long section there. Again, I suggest take a break, right? Take a break, uh, pause the video, go away, you know, uh, shut down YouTube, whatever. Uh, come back later, hit the timestamp for the next part of the lesson, and that is uh, using bullet points. Okay, so take a break. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, welcome back. We're continuing on Unit 5, and we're on the third writing tip of Unit 5, and that is to use bullet points where appropriate. And I'm going to use bullet points to introduce this idea to you. So first of all, make the purpose of your email clear at the beginning. Bullet points can do this. If you're writing an email and you have two, three, four goals in your email, you might mention this right at the beginning of your email using a bullet list. I am contacting you about the following issues. 
colon, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Okay? Another thing that you should remember when using bullet points is to organize the important points of your email in an easy to read format. This helps communicate your message very concisely, very quickly to the reader. Many readers have a lot of emails every day. They want to be able to catch the intention or catch the valuable information from your communication right away. Okay. Also, you want to draw your reader's attention to the essential elements or requests or goals of your email. If you have two requests, for example, you might use a bullet list to emphasize those so that the reader will not miss one of those requests. Now, there is an example on page 57. On page 57, you can see an email here and an email down here. And uh, the email up here, you can see that if you read it, and go ahead and take, you know, pause the video anytime. Go ahead and, and look at page 57, read the email. You can see that in the email, there are actually two requests for information, but you have to read all of the sentences. In the second email, it starts off with, could you please send me one and two? So that's very clear. And this is what I was talking about before, when you want to draw your reader's attention to your specific requests. It's very useful for request emails. Um, so just put them up right here. Then there's no question. And you know, in this, in this format, the reader could, might, might miss one of the requests, especially if there are more than two, right? And they might just do one or two, but this way it's less likely that they will miss one of those requests. So bullet points can be very useful in drawing your reader's attention to the essential elements of your email. Now we have a couple of examples over on page 58. And uh, I want to go over these with you. And, you know, we have a long paragraph here because, you know, usually when you use bullet points, you're taking a large chunk of information. It might be a long paragraph and you're breaking it up into an easier to read, easier to digest, intellectually digest, not physically digest, uh, the information that you're sending to somebody. So this long paragraph here, sorry, it's a little bit long, but let's go over it. The advantages of the FSX connector are that it supports higher data rates than traditional copper interfaces. It also is capable of housing optical cabling. Another benefit is that it provides a standard interface at the equipment. Customers can choose which transceiver, module, and cable to use depending on their needs. Now, I'm a little bit confused here because I'm, uh, I could be confused when I first read this by how many advantages, right? The key point in this paragraph is that there are many advantages. How many are there? Right? Well, first are that it supports higher data rates than traditional copper interfaces. It also is capable of housing optical cabling. Another benefit is that it provides a standard interface at the equipment. Now, is this another one? No, this sentence here, this information, I'm trying to draw a circle around it. This information here is actually uh, supporting the third main uh, benefit or advantage of the equipment. So it's not a standalone advantage, it's actually supporting this last benefit. So how can we rewrite this in a bullet point list so that it's clear? We could write, there are three advantages to the FSX, com FSX com connector. That's kind of a tongue twister right there. Okay, so there are three advantages. So you're making it easier for the reader to, to number them, right? Here in the original, in the original up here, it said the advantages are, but it doesn't say how many advantages. So it's up to the reader to kind of figure out, okay, well, how many advantages are there? And they have to read very carefully to figure it out. Why make your reader do all that work? Do it for them. There are three advantages to the FS, FSX connector. Note the use of the colon here. This is very important when making bullet points. Most bullet point lists will start with a complete sentence and then you use a colon and then you uh, use the bullet points. And you can use a dash, you can use a number, uh, you could use a, a dot. Now be careful here, don't use don't get carried away and use little cutesy bullet points like little stars or, or moons or, you know, happy faces. That's not really professional. Keep it conservative. Keep it professional. Okay, so it supports higher data rates than traditional copper interfaces, period. It is capable of housing 
optical cabling, period. It provides a standard interface, which allows customers flexibility in choosing transceivers and cables, right? So that this last bullet point that you can see here combines all of this information here because that is the structure. Now, if you didn't do this, the reader has to put that together in his or her mind when they read the original uh, sentence. And like I'm saying, bullet points are useful for you to give a mental picture to make it very clear to the reader what you're thinking, right? So that they don't have to decipher what you've written. Notice I pointed out the colon. Notice I also said uh, we also have periods at the end of each one. Why do we have periods? Well, because each one is a complete sentence, okay? We can also do something else. We could also do this. Again, we used a colon, fine, but you could also use a semicolon. And notice that these are not complete sentences here. It starts off with advantage of the FSX com connector include higher data rates. I'm not using a complete sentence like I did previously. It supports, it is capable, it provides. I'm not doing that. I could also just write higher data rates that tradition, then, tra then, that's a mistake, sorry about that, than traditional copper interfaces. Capability of housing optical cabling, semicolon and. Before the last item on the list, put and after the semicolon, continue, and then use a period to finish. Now that is a standard way to do it. That is a, a widely accepted method of using bullet points. It is a little bit more formal, but uh, again, if you're writing formal email, this is much better. Some people say, oh, you don't need the semicolons, just use commas. I prefer the semicolons uh, because it does look more formal and semicolons are specifically used to separate long complex items in a list. If your bullet list items are very short, one word or two word, and you don't need semicolons, just use a colon, that's fine. But for longer phrases, I would recommend using a semicolon because that's what you do if you wrote it all out in one paragraph anyway. So what I just covered with punctuating, I've mentioned several points. Now there is some more information or some more tips for you. And the information on the bottom of page 58 here, uh, I've, I've condensed on this slide as well, so we can go over it. So, you know, the lead sentence should be a complete sentence and end in a colon. I showed you the example of that. And that, by the way, is the proper use of a colon to introduce a list of things. But before you use a colon, technically it should be a complete sentence. Now, technically, as I said, the lead sentence should be a complete sentence, but sometimes it's common to break up a really long sentence. And so the, the, the part that you have before the colon isn't technically a complete sentence. Should I use a colon in that case? Well, even though it kind of breaks the traditional rule of colon usage, it's fine. Most people do it that way. And I don't think, you know, unless, unless somebody is a, a gram, uh, a grammar, I don't want to say, gra people say grammar Nazi. Okay, that's very strong language. Uh, if somebody's very uh, uh, picky about grammar, they might have an issue with that, but most people don't. So technically you should use a colon after a complete sentence, but sometimes people just start a sentence and they break up that sentence with, and they use a colon without making sure that what occurs before that colon is a complete sentence. That's fine. If your bullet list consists of full sentences, it's a good idea to start each point with a capital letter and end each point with a period. So if it's if the bullet uh, points on your list are full sentences, yeah, capitalize uh, the, the first letter of the first word and end that bullet item with a period and then move on to the next one. Keep doing that. If your bullet list is a continuation of a sentence, for example, uh, exactly, don't capitalize the first letter, put a semicolon after each item, or a comma, depending on how long they are. Use and after the last semicolon, finish the last item with a period. Okay, so those are common uh, guidelines for using bullet point lists. Okay, so is it time to do some exercises making bullet points? Almost, because there's one more important thing that I want to go over with, that's the last tip. Uh, for this unit. Now, if you want to take a break, go ahead and take a break, but that was kind of short, so I'm going to just kind of go into the next part and the next writing tip, which is very closely related to um, bullet points. But if you do want to take a break, again, just resume at the timestamp down below. Okay, welcome back. 
Uh, what we're going over is the fourth tip in Unit 5, and that is to use parallel structure. And this is very closely connected to what we just talked about uh, when we discussed using bullet points. What is parallel structure? Parallel, parallel structure is basically making sure that all the elements in your sentence, if you have a compound sentence, that all the elements are of the same grammatical structure. We have an example here. This is poor example. The benefits of networking include learning about the latest information in the industry. You can increase your opportunities. And it's a good idea to raise the visibility of your profile. This is not parallel structure. Why? Well, we can see very quickly. We have three items here, right? Include learning about the latest information. It starts off with learning about, which is a verb clause. And then it starts, you can increase, which is, you know, that's a sentence. You can increase your opportunities. That's a full sentence by itself. And then it's a good idea. So it's also repetitious, right? We don't have to say that because, you know, it's a benefit. You know, it's kind of redundant anyway. So we don't really need to do that. It would be much more efficient if we rewrote it this way. The benefits of network include learning about the latest industry developments, developments increasing opportunities, and raising. See what happened here. Now, our grammatical structure the same. Verb ing, verb ing, verb ing introduce each point, each benefit of networking. So this is parallel structure. And not only should you follow it in sentences, but also in bullet points. So we're going to practice making bullet point lists. We're going to practice what we learned in the third tip about, especially with punctuation, cutting them down. But we're also going to practice uh, using parallel structure. Now, uh, the first example or the first exercise here is analytic technologies have three main types. Okay, so we know our bullet point list will have three items, including descriptive analytics, prescriptive analy analytics, and predictive analytics. So they're already in parallel structure. What I'm, I'm, this is, I'm giving you an easy one here to just practice punctuation, as we learned uh, previously. Okay, so how would we rewrite this? How would we make a bullet point list using proper punctuation? Well, we can start by writing analytic technologies have three, excuse me, analytic technologies have three main types. This is a complete sentence here. <clears throat> and we introduce the bullet point list with a colon. So then we have our bullet list. Descriptive analytics. I used a comma here because it's not very long, not necessary to use a semicolon. You can use it if you want to. Descriptive analytics, prescriptive analytics, and predictive analytics. And then period to finish your bullet point list. And that's very common. It's a very common, very accepted, uh, commonly followed way to make a bullet point list. Okay, next one, number two. Using our analytics software, your organization can accurately predict competitors' responses, easily plan and schedule activities that meet your customers' needs, and identify latent market demand. Okay, so uh, we have three things here, right? Your organization can, and uh, this is probably where we would break it, right here. And we have, what can you do? You can accurately predict competitors' responses, you can easily plan and schedule activities, and you can identify latent market demand. So we have three items in our bullet point list. So how can we make a bullet list out of this information? Well, we can start with our analytics software provides you with the ability to, and then colon. Now notice that this is not a complete sentence. So like I said, traditionally, you know, people are very strict about their grammar and using punctuation correctly it should be a complete sentence. But like I said, many people don't do this. And so you might see this, right? And it's okay. Technically it's incorrect, but not a lot of people will care. <laughs> okay. Our analytics software provides you with the ability to, and then we have the colon. Now I changed it, provides you with the ability to, because I, f I felt that provides you with the ability to is more formal than just saying can, right? Uh, your organization can. No, it provides you with the ability to. So it sounds uh, more elegant, uh, more sophisticated, more professional language. That's the reason I made that change there. So here we have accurately predict, easily plan, and notice that I put quickly identify. Quickly is not here, but I added that because um, 
if you look at this bullet list, I want to follow parallel structure carefully. So I have adverb, verb, adverb, verb, and then adverb, verb. So I added quickly. Now, if that's true, you know, I'm not sure if that's true. Of course, don't make up something that's not true. But if you can, you know, use the proper adverb to go with the verb or, you know, get rid of them. Uh, just predict competitor responses, plan and schedule, and then identify, right? But it's good to keep a good, tight uh, parallel structure so that, again, your reader doesn't have to uh, sort through different grammatical structures because that's a hurdle. That's something that they, ha that's an obstacle that they have to overcome to understand what you're saying. If you lay it out in parallel structure using the same types of uh, grammatical structures, it's much easier for the reader to process that information. That's what we're, that's what our goal is here. Okay, the last one. The symposium will include lectures on many of the factors that influence public policy, such as public opinion, whether the economy is improving or deteriorating. Scientists are discovering new technologies. Many people are upset about the influence of special interest lobbies. Now, this is not actually a grammatically correct sentence, right? It's, uh, it's, it has fragments of sentences in with the whole sentence. Now, this is a lot of information, so I can't put the bullet list right underneath. And uh, before that, also, we should try to figure out how many items should we have in our bullet list? Well, here we have public opinion, whether the economy is improving or deteriorating, scientists are discovering new technologies, and many people are upset about the influence of special interest lobbies. There are four items we're going to probably have in our bullet uh, list. These are the four items, but as you can see, they are not parallel structure. They're kind of a jumble and they're kind of confusing the way that they are written out. Okay, so how can we divide this information into a bullet list with four items? We could start off by saying, the symposium will include lectures on factors that influence public policy, such as. And notice that we're saying on factors. Those are our bullet point list, factors. Factors, we could use nouns to make our bullet point list. So we could say public opinion, that's a noun. Before the noun, we have an adjective. That's the same as the next one. We have our noun indicators. What indicators? Economic indicators. Next one, technologies. What technologies? New technologies. So adjective, noun, adjective, noun, adjective, noun. Parallel structure for all of them. And it avoids a lot of that confusing language that we saw in the original. Now we're just focusing on the key factors. And now the last one I had to change a little bit because the noun is influence. And what is the influence? What is the adjective? Well, the adjective is special interest lobbies. And it's a little awkward to write and special interest lobby influence. I mean, you could write it, but it's a little strange. It's a little bit, it's a little bit odd uh, wording. So I would write the influence of special interest lobbies. So it's not exactly parallel structure for each, but sometimes you have to bend uh, the structure a little bit. And this is a good example of that. So. When you make your bullet point list, make sure that the items in the list are parallel in structure. Follow the common punctuation uh, rules, you know, use a colon to introduce your list, hopefully after a complete sentence, but like I said, it's not, you know, that necessary to do it. Nobody's gonna, nobody's going to notice probably if you do or not, although technically it should be a complete sentence. Then use semicolons or commas, depending on how long they are. Here I use semicolons. Use and before the last one, and then use a period at the end. Okay, so those are four writing tips for you to improve your writing and to improve your ability to communicate effectively and easily with your reader. Remember, eliminate unnecessary words. Keep related words together or items together. Use bullet lists and use parallel structure. These are uh, some common tips that you should keep in mind when writing, especially when writing emails. So I hope these tips, I hope this practice, and I hope this was useful to you and that you can use these techniques and you can go on to produce more effective emails. Thank you very much for studying with me and I hope to see you in the next lesson. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.